Welcome back to Mom in Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. On this episode, I am joined by the amazing Paige Bellenbaum. She is a social worker and the founding director and chief external relations officer at the Motherhood Center of New York. And this Motherhood Center is doing phenomenal work in the field of perinatal mental health, really helping us all push the dial forward in the kind of care that new moms who are suffering should be receiving. Paige is going to talk to us how she came into this work and through her own experience through perinatal mental health and how she was able to put forth some legislation as well in New York that has passed. And we're going to talk about the importance of education and treatment and screening and why higher levels of care are so important for women and birthing people that are experiencing moderate to severe perinatal mood or anxiety disorders. Paige does so much work in the maternal mental health field. She has worked in the field of public policy, advocacy, community organizing, and direct practice with disadvantaged communities. And after her first child was born, the postpartum depression and anxiety she experienced nearly ended her life. And after she began to heal, she became really committed to fighting for education, screening, and treatment so that no one has to suffer. And she drafted legislation in New York State championed by state Senator Liz Krueger, mandating hospitals to provide education and encourage screening of all new and expecting mothers. She continues to work closely with multiple New York City agencies on maternal mental health best practices and policies, including the NYPD, the Nurse Family Partnership, the Administration for Children's Services, and she was a member of the NYC Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee and currently sits on the NYS Maternal Mental Health Working Group. And in and among all of her efforts to get the word out, she's appeared on the Today Show, Good Morning America, NPR, and various other major media platforms. I'm excited to dig in and for you to hear from Paige how important it is that we're getting adequate care to new mothers. So let's dive in. Welcome, Paige. Thank you for being here. So happy to be here with you, Kat. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. I've, I've, met you a while back in Philly. I think it was Philly. I met you in person um, and just have been in awe of the work that you do with the Motherhood Center and just your impact in perinatal mental health in general in the field. Um, so would love to learn about all of those things for sure. Um, but definitely how, how did you come into this work of perinatal mental health? Well, thank you for saying what you did. And I feel exactly the same way about you. Uh, You know, it's such an interesting question. I was just speaking to uh, someone earlier today who survived a perineal mood and anxiety disorder. And I get a lot of calls from a lot of former patients that say, I went through this experience and I want to change my career. I want to do something totally different in the field of maternal mental health. And I share that because I like so many of those people that I speak with had the same experience in my life. Mm -hmm. I have two children. I have a son who's 18. I have a daughter who's about 16. And oh my goodness, um, when they say it doesn't get easier, it just keeps changing. That is so true. Mm -hmm. And after my first child was born, my son 18 years ago, I experienced debilitating postpartum depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was 18 years ago when nobody was talking about maternal mental health. And I mean, nobody. And even for me as a licensed social worker and a clinician who was trained to recognize mental illness in others, when it happened to me, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just felt like I was in in a deep, dark sea paddling as hard as I could just to keep my head above water and breathe. And this went on for seven months. I didn't tell anybody. uh, And I'm lucky to be here. And as a result of that, uh, once I got better, and I got the treatment I needed, uh, I started to get really pissed. I hope it's okay for me to say. Oh, yeah. Yes, you can. (laughs) I got mad because the more women I spoke to about my own experience, the more and more I heard, I feel the same way that happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is going on? That right. it's like one in every four or five women I speak to mm-hmm. is going through this or did. Why is nothing happening? Right. And so with a public policy background and having worked on uh, legislation and community organizing, 
my fire to make change was to go the public policy route. Mm -hmm. So I started researching legislation uh, in different cities and states that addressed maternal mental health. And oh, nice. 18 years ago, as you can imagine, there was hardly any. Right. Um, and ended up cobbling together what I considered to be a model bill around screening and education. I gave it to a state senator that I'd worked with on a number of issues previous to my own experience. And she said, oh my gosh, we're doing this. Nice. And three years later, we got that bill signed into law here in New York State. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. When you think of like, how can one person change things? Like you did that. That's amazing. I did. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the power that every single woman and birthing parent has mm -hmm. to contribute to moving the dial, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In their own way. And mm -hmm. for me, that was the way that I felt like I could contribute and then went on to open the doors of the Motherhood Center just a few years later with Dr. Berndorf to ensure that at this point, thousands and thousands and thousands of women get the support and the clinical treatment that they need and deserve to recover from a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. That's amazing. It is so amazing, right? I mean, do you ever, <laughs> maybe it's hard to see it and feel it as, as you, um, like doing all of those things, but from the outside, it's just amazing what you've done. You know, what's amazing. Thank you for that. What's amazing and what never ceases to be amazing. And look, there are days, and I would say this to Dr. Berndorf, where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. This is crazy. Who could be crazy enough to build out a maternal mental health startup and provide clinical treatment to women who are acutely, acutely ill? Mm -hmm. uh, and every single time I reach that point, somebody will discharge from the day program and they will fill out a survey talking about their experience and they will write again and again, this place saved my life. And I don't need anything else. Right. That's right. all I need forever. Right. 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 One person, mm -hmm. a thousand people to be able to be a part of such an incredible clinical team mm -hmm. that's able to provide this life changing transformation for new and expecting mothers and birthing people. That's, that's, that's the power. Like that's, that's so what's cool. truly amazing. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, and, I want to talk a lot more about the Motherhood Center um, in in a little bit, um, but I want to first touch on some of the stuff that you kind of started with in your bill around um, kind of training and screening and and stuff like that. So, what did that bill start? So we started working on this bill in 2012. Uh, and based on some of the literature and some of the other model bills that I'd come across, I had seen that one of the ways that states were taking action was around screening. Mm -hmm. At the time, there was just a handful, I could count on my one hand, of states that had legislated mandatory screening for postpartum depression by using the Enberg Postnatal Depression Scale, the EVDS. And I felt at the time, you know, that that was something we definitely needed to look at legislating. I had never heard of this instrument before. I certainly had never been screened mm -hmm. with the during the pregnancy or the postpartum period with either of my children. Granted, this was quite a while ago. And at the time, it felt like this would be a necessary measure to ultimately catch more women and birthing people before they fell through the cracks uh, into that dark, vast ocean that I mentioned in the beginning yeah. and get connected to care and support. Mm -hmm. So one of the elements of that bill was to require screening for new and expecting mothers throughout pregnancy into the postpartum period regularly, but without a set schedule, right? So mm -hmm. frequent screening in the during pregnancy and in the postpartum. And the other part of that bill was to provide psychoeducation to women and birthing people and their families prior to discharge from the hospital where they mm -hmm. delivered and to make sure that everybody was given information on maternal mental health and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, what they look like, but most importantly, what are the resources available so that if someone was struggling, mm -hmm. they knew who to call and what to do. Amazing. Now, what's interesting about this bill is that when it did make it to the governor's desk the first time, he vetoed the bill. And his veto memo stated that 
it wasn't his job to tell the medical community how to do their job. So he wasn't going to legislate required screening. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back to the drawing board and water it down to Mm -hmm. strongly recommend screening. Oh, interesting. So those two pieces of the bill were signed into law, which is super exciting. That said, as with many bills um, and public policy declarations, it's hard to know what the follow-up and oversight of those types of of bills actually is, right? So I don't know that there's like a workforce of people who work for the Office of Mental Health in New York State that go around and check hospitals and make sure literature is in everybody's discharge bag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that said, it's meant to be happening. And that Uh was the first time in New York that there was ever any kind of legislation on the books around postpartum depression or maternal mental health. Wow. Wow. That's really pushing the dial, as you said, um, forward. Okay. So what have you seen, I guess, since then in terms of um, not necessarily just things that are um, through the government or regulated, but just in terms of um, education, training, screening, those types of things, how has it grown? You know, I used to do a presentation a few years ago, and one of the slides was the progress that we've made around maternal mental health uh, up until about 2018, 2019. And it was pretty limited, if not stagnant. There was that bill, there was some movement happening with uh, larger global organizations like ACOG and the American Pediatric Association that started to recommend screening Mm -hmm. uh, more routinely, but again, nothing regulated, nothing mandatory. And then you move forward to when uh, when the CDC released their statistics around maternal death Mm. and that they identified mental illness being the leading cause of maternal death in this country, which I want to say was 2022, Mm. maybe late 2021. And the entire conversation changed. Right. For the first time in history, maternal mental health was a policy topic. It was a, an issue that people started paying attention to and started talking about. And since that, there has been a flurry of activity in this field. Mm -hmm. And when I speak to reporters, when I speak to providers, when I do trainings, I say maternal mental health has arrived. Mm -hmm. Now we could arrive a heck of a lot more and we will. (laughs) But when we compare ourselves to where we are now, to where we were even four or five years ago, this issue has exploded and people Mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. finally paying attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Exploded all the way to the White House. (laughs) Yeah. Even. Yeah. The task force that came out with a very robust blueprint of recommendations on how to improve maternal mental health outcomes, Mm -hmm. the different bills that have been, um, you know, coming online and passing around different types of interventions, whether it's screening or psychoeducation or providing funding for treatment, we're seeing states and localities really beginning to put their money where their mouth is. I always have to say, love for it to continue. It's not like we've cracked the code, but there's so much more attention and commitment to this critical issue far more than ever before. Mm Yeah. Okay. So with that, um, I guess it's not even a groundswell, like it's, it's here. (laughs) Um, like you're saying, I think it's here. And I think, you know, I think it's here. And I think that the conversation is starting to change, right. From Mm -hmm. public awareness, right. Yeah. People are talking about this more, Mm -hmm. whereas we were living in a culture where we had this very romanticized and glamorized version of motherhood, Mm -hmm. which the women that I speak to today and tomorrow are still going to say, I thought this was going to be very different. This isn't what I signed up for. My expectations are not touching reality. Right. And yet at the same time, that dialogue and narrative is starting to shift, right? So Mm -hmm. we have more platforms, we have more people coming forward, sharing their story, giving other new and expecting mothers and birthing people permission Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. to talk about how hard this is. Yeah. We have uh, hospital systems and maternal mental health platforms that are coming online everywhere that are geared to providing support and clinical intervention mm -hmm. to new and expecting mothers that are experiencing perineal mood and anxiety disorders. We have local governments, state governments, federal mm -hmm. governments that are starting to pay attention to this issue. Mm -hmm. I had my last meeting with the New York State Maternal Mental Health Task Force just last week, where we created a 150-page document chock full of recommendations around psychoeducation, screening, treatment interventions, best practices for New York State's Office of Mental Health to roll out that will go to the governor's desk for signature. It will wow. be signed off on by the legislature, fingers crossed, right, right. to really make an impact in maternal mental health outcomes. So the movement is happening. We're seeing more training yeah. programs that clinicians have access to, okay. wonderful programs like PSI. So we're yeah. growing our workforce. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are happening um, and the conversation's changing. And people are still struggling silently. Mm -hmm. Ugh, I hate that. I mean, I it's it. Uh, you you see it sort of very up close how difficult um, it can be, how impactful, life changing um, it can be to have a a severe perinatal mental health condition. Um, and I'm, I don't know if you feel like pulling your hair out when you, <laughs> when you see that discrepancy between like how, yeah, we're moving forward and we still have so much more to do. I do. Yeah. You know, one of the places I hear it the most in bulk is I run two support groups a week, a pregnancy support group and a postpartum support group. And the majority of women and birthing people that join those groups are from the tri-state area, but I also get a lot of women from across the U.S. and also mm -hmm. women internationally at times. Mm -hmm. And every time I take notes when I run that group, I must have run, I don't know, thousands of groups at this point. Yeah. And every time I run that group, the same issues come up again and again and again, yeah. right? This isn't what I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. I feel like a failure as a mother. I'm struggling with breastfeeding and I feel like a failure because I can't get it right. I'm struggling with my partner because I feel like I'm doing everything and or he or she isn't doing anything or enough. Mm -hmm. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I regret having had a baby. I wish I never did this. Mm -hmm. What kind of a mother has these thoughts and feelings again and again and again? And that is the narrative. And these are women that aren't even necessarily diagnosed with an actual perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. Right. right. This is the experience of new and expecting mothers universally, not just here in the U.S., but across the globe uh -huh. that are facing these challenges, feeling unsupported by the workplace, feeling unsupported by a healthcare system that isn't meeting their needs mm -hmm. and feeling like once the baby was born, that they as a mother were kind of cast aside. Oh, right. It's like, the candy and the candy wrapper, right? Once mm -hmm. the baby was born, all the attention is on him and her or her. Nobody's paying attention to me. Nobody's asking me how I'm feeling. I feel lonely. I feel isolated, right? Yeah. Whereas it used to take a village. Now it's just me. I have no family around me. My partner went back to work the week after we had the baby and I feel totally alone. Mm -hmm. And it's the same story again and again and again. Right. And so in light of all of these innovations that are happening, I do sincerely hope that, that these policy shifts, that these priorities start to trickle down to the actual people right. who need to feel the impact the most. Right. Uh, and that, you know, a lot of these these new and innovative practices don't just become um, a beautiful set of recommendations that gets placed on a shelf somewhere and gets mm -hmm. dusty, mm -hmm. but doesn't get implemented, which I hate to say mm -hmm. wouldn't be a government's first rodeo. So right. <laughs> the conversation remains the same. And I guess that's the heartbreaking part of it yeah. to hear that story again and again and again 
And if I might also add, Kat, you know, there's this article that I've been meaning to write, and it's coming out. And I think, look, the Surgeon General's recent report all about parenting and mental health and anxiety um, kind of ripped the band-aid off of this one. But I also feel like this is one of the hardest times in history to be a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I say that is there is a whole industry that has been built around motherhood today, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's the best product, the best sleep, getting your baby to sleep strategy, the best feeding your baby situation, all of the, the images and narratives that women are exposed to on social media of how you get up and you make breakfast for your whole family and you have your hair done and your makeup on, mm -hmm. and then you make homemade cupcakes from scratch for your kindergartner the next day while creating a crudite that takes up the entire table. It's like, yeah. what? Like it is so much pressure mm -hmm. that mothers feel like they have to conform to. Yep. And all these, if you buy this thing, then that will happen. If you follow right. this practice, then that will happen. And the noise right. in a new mother's mind, right of just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to choose. Yes. Makes it so hard. Yeah. Um, I think you're making such an important point. Um, it, it, it is, and, and people, and you know, this, you know, just uh, better than anybody that it doesn't feel like, oh, well, I'm being uh, told that I should do all of these things and I, so I don't know which one to do. So um, that's why I feel bad. It's just that you just feel inadequate in yes. in all of that. It, it's really hard to pinpoint the, all of the contextual factors that are uh, bombarding us that are making us feel bad at any given moment. It's just kind of ever present. And you just sort of, uh, you know, at the very least feel under the weight of all of it. And at the worst, like feel like the failure. Yeah, and I think, right, like for the first time also just reflecting on policy, right, we have some really important issues that are at the forefront of this election. Mm -hmm. We have a presidential candidate who's talking about child care and mm -hmm. paid leave mm -hmm. for the first time in history, right? These right. are structural changes yes. that will absolutely make a difference in the lives of new and expecting parents mm -hmm. across the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you know, to just add to that, um, to that challenge and difficulty, particularly for, you know, women and birthing people in the year 2024, like, there's a lot of pressure to like juggle all the balls all at the mm -hmm. same time, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be a high performing professional, right? I might be the primary bed winner. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who is supposed to have the six figure job and also only take three months of 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 leave postpartum and also had a cesarean section and have three other kids to take care of and it's like it is not possible for a human being right to do all of these things right and god bless the woman um who wrote lean in as a person but i hate that book <laughs> i hate that book cat right, right. I, I we couldn't you. lean in any further if we tried and we can right. only lean in so much before we break but and yes. before we have actual policies that support us in place. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you said that. It is. It, you're absolutely right. Um, it is too much pressure. There was already too much pressure and now do more. Um, it, it is too much. So, I mean, in, in your... In the groups, when you hear people talk about it, um, are these conversations being um, coming up about like why it feels this way? How do you how do you talk to people about that? You know, one of the things that I find so powerful in these groups, and I think why support groups are such an important intervention, and the whole peer support movement also that's getting a lot of growing attention is so critical. For so many women and birthing people that are experiencing the challenges of this transition and feeling so alone along the way, it's the feeling less alone that can make all the difference. That can be the best medicine mm -hmm. for people who are having more mild symptoms. And so the validation that people get 
from hearing each other's stories and realizing I'm not the only one. There's other people in this group that feel exactly the same way I do. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like such a monster anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that in itself can be so healing. And in the process of that, also validating that these things that we're discussing here today exist. Right. And as a result, these are external factors that are mm -hmm. placing a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on new mothers and birthing people mm -hmm. that make it that much harder, mm -hmm. that it is not humanly possible for anybody, even, you know, a Marvel superhero <laughs> to right. be all the, to do all the things that mothers and women are expected to do, yeah. especially in that first year postpartum. And I think, right. again, receiving that permission and mm -hmm. validation and saying, look, you're not crazy for feeling this way. It's right. actually happening. Oh, right. The bar is so high right. that nobody can meet it. Right. And that's why being good enough is like, that's where it's at. Right. Right. But not everybody has access to that perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the further we are from being permission to connect with that perspective, the greater divide we have from feeling like we're not such a bad person right. for having these thoughts and feelings. Right. So right. I think it's it's validating the experience. It's having a sense of community with other people. Yeah. And it's also having it pointed out, like it's a really hard time to be a mom. And this is yeah, why. For sure. And it's it's so important to break that down for for the individual and, and then to have the community of other people who can, you know, in the group to support them. Um, especially because like, while they might be starting to internalize that for themselves, they're going to walk out into a world that is still putting that pressure on them, maybe even within their family, maybe even their partner, like in their home. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's so hard to hold on to that, um, that sense of, okay, I'm not a bad mom. I'm not a bad person. When the message is kind of just keeps coming, it just keeps it's coming. It does keep coming. It does keep coming, but it also matters where you look. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why groups like PSI, mm -hmm. um, being able to have a little bit more control over your Instagram feed and yeah. following platforms that are sending these messages that normalize mm -hmm. how difficult it is to become a mother. Mm -hmm that there are ways that we can start to minimize that one narrative that feels like it's everywhere. Yeah, but to yeah. your point, yeah, it, it, you know, again, when I think back to support groups that I run, what, it, what are some of the other primary issues that come up is even when I tell my own mom or my mother-in-law or my sister, this is really hard for me, I'm struggling. The message I get is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not that hard. Right. If you experienced loss or right. if you went through infertility treatments, you should be more happy that you have a baby now, considering what you went through. Focus on the pace positive. You have a happy, healthy baby now, right? And it's so stifling yeah. and it's so disparaging. Yeah. Uh, and it just shuts people down, even For when sure. they try to find an olive branch to mm -hmm. cling on mm -hmm. to. And that's why so much of the work that I do now as a trainer, as an educator in the field of maternal mental health, if I'm speaking to a room full of OBGYNs uh, or midwives or doulas, one of the things I will say is 100% education, psychoeducation from preconception. We need to be yes. talking about yes. women and their families, about maternal mental health. What are the risk factors? What do you look out for? Mm -hmm. Screening, screening, screening. But one of the things we absolutely have to do is make sure that partners and close family members know the signs and symptoms too, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. so often, and I can speak from experience when I was going through it, I couldn't pick up the phone to see whether or not a provider accepted my insurance. Right. I could barely get myself into a shower once a week, right? Right. right. So family members, particularly partners, have to be educated on maternal mental health. What are the resources? What to look for? Mm -hmm. And so when, they're, when, when we don't provide that education, then we, 
it, it can feel that much more complicated and difficult for yeah. a newer expecting mom who's struggling. Yeah. And it's not the fault of the partner, or right. it's usually not. They just don't know. They were fed right. the same narrative. <laughs> right. Pregnancy is glowing and blissful. Having a baby is the best thing that ever happened to you. What's wrong with my wife, girlfriend, fiance, or partner? I don't understand. This is supposed to be awesome. And she can't even get out of bed to feed the baby. Right. Let alone be able to, like, you can't um, sometimes even understand what's going on for yourself, let alone be able to explain it, put it into words to somebody else for them to understand it. It's a lot of work, but also there's, like, you can't string together all of the words that like fully describe what it is like. Um, so yeah, sometimes somebody else needs to do that, um, on their behalf. Um, but yeah, Yeah. that education is so important. We have, uh, at the mother at dinner, it was a life preserver. And the reason for that is that when I was at my lowest and I was drowning, I kept wishing and hoping that someone would just pull me a life preserver, throw me a life preserver and pull me out onto the shore. Mm. Uh, And I waited and waited. And, you know, in so many ways, that represents what the motherhood center does. But I also use it as an analogy for partners and family members, right? Mm -hmm. You can be the life preserver to help pull that mom out of the water onto the shore so that she can breathe um, and she can start to get better and stop paddling to, to keep herself alive. Uh, and I think it's such a powerful tool, you know, creating more awareness and psycho ed for family members around this because they really can be the one that saves a life. They're definitely. I'm right. Especially if they're around um, the the mom or the person who's suffering the most are going to see see the most. But I mean, they might be scared themselves. They, they yeah. you might not understand what what's happening and and themselves need the support too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, um, you're talking about the logo for the motherhood center and I, I love what you guys are doing. Um, I wish it was everywhere. Um, but can you tell people what the motherhood center is and, and what you do? We wish the Motherhood Center was everywhere too. Uh, And maybe we will be at some point in time. We're actually in the process of expanding. But so the Motherhood Center is located in New York City. Although we treat women from all over New York State uh, and also in New Jersey. And we have a few clinicians that are licensed in Connecticut. Mm. And our mission is to provide education, support, and clinical treatment to new and expecting mothers and birthing people that are struggling with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And we do that through support groups, like I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. We have a very robust outpatient treatment team. So we have an army of perinatal therapists that are all trained in perinatal mental health and have years of experience, both psychologists and social workers. And we have a prescribing team, predominantly of reproductive psychiatrists, Mm -hmm. who specialize in medication that's safe and effective to take in the perinatal period, Mm -hmm. which is such an important area of expertise and I'm so glad to see is growing. Mm -hmm. Because as you well know, Kat, there is a dearth of psychiatrists who specialize in the area of reproductive mental health. Um, And it's so necessary because it is a vulnerable time for patients. And a lot of MDs are afraid to touch medication with a 10 foot pole when Mm -hmm. someone's pregnant or breastfeeding. Now, the other thing that we do that uh, is doesn't exist anywhere else in New York state, as I mentioned, is we run a perinatal partial hospital program. And this is what I categorize as a higher level of care. So if you can imagine, um, you know, For if you're looking at a physical health condition where perhaps maybe a situation where you were having some back problems and you went to physical therapy on a regular basis, but things took a turn for the worse and it ended up that you needed to have surgery or you needed to have some other type of physical intervention because your symptoms had gotten worse, Mm -hmm. right? I liken that to uh, the hierarchy of levels of care to treat a a mental health condition. So Mm -hmm. For patients that access a higher level of care, and in our case, a partial hospital program, these are patients that perhaps were in outpatient treatment previously, so they were seeing a therapist and or a psychiatrist for medication. 
but that intervention is not enough. This mm -hmm. person needs more help, more support, more care. And so a partial hospital program is a program that runs five days a week for five hours a day. It's comprised of groups for both pregnant and postpartum women. And these can be process groups, skills-based groups, dyadic groups, which are all about attachment and bonding between mother and baby, expressive groups where there's music therapy, art therapy, mindfulness and meditation, mm -hmm. individual treatment. So every patient in the day program is followed by a perinatal therapist who they see two to three times a week a reproductive psychiatrist who they see one to two times a week. This is on average. It can certainly be more if the acuity is higher. Mm -hmm. We offer couple support, family support. So we have family sessions very often with partner to talk about ways in which they can be supportive and also talk about challenges that they're having. Mm -hmm. We have a partner support group, which I run, and I have to say between us is my favorite group. <laughs> these dads and partners cat when I tell you I had I was running a group on Friday and one of the dads had joined us um uh from his car started crying and said when he introduced himself for two years we've been struggling mm. and I haven't been able to talk to anybody about this this is the first time I've been around other people who know exactly what I'm going oh, through was that the dad? That's and so it's horrible. Right. Like when you had mentioned earlier, like, yeah, dads struggle with PMATs too. Mm -hmm. Right. And dads are the ones that are dancing as fast as they can to support new or expecting mom who's struggling. Yeah. So all of these interventions are offered in one place. We have an on-site nursery for patients mm -hmm. who come in person yeah. that's staffed by a skilled set of childcare providers. So moms with baby can leave their baby in the nursery as much or as little as needed. We have uh, places for women to breastfeed, pump, bottle feed all throughout the facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and women are usually with us anywhere from four weeks to eight weeks, sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. The other way that we get patients in the partial hospital program is step downs from inpatient. Mm -hmm. So for women that, had, um, that were actively suicidal or had mm -hmm. symptoms that were so acute and distressing that they required hospitalization, including mm -hmm. psychosis, mm -hmm. we receive those patients mm -hmm. when they are discharged from the hospital. Okay. And it's these higher levels of care cat that are starting to grow a little bit more, mm -hmm. but not nearly enough. Right. And the way I always like to explain treatment to lay people or elected officials or to those that don't have a lot of experience understanding uh, you know, the, the different levels of intervention mm -hmm. is, you know, when you think about acuity, you think about symptoms on a mild, moderate, and acute line. Mm -hmm. um, and so for people who are experiencing more mild symptoms, mm -hmm. right? Prevention can be incredibly helpful. Right. Peer support can be incredibly helpful. Support groups, mm -hmm. uh, even seeing a therapist once a week, right? Mm -hmm. These, what I refer to as, as softer interventions can be totally effective. Right. That can be all somebody needs to feel better. Right. For people whose symptoms are a little bit more acute and maybe fall into the moderate category, mm -hmm. maybe those are people that are seeing a therapist once a week and they're also seeing a psychiatrist and they're taking medication. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're going to a support group once a week or once mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. But then for the people that are struggling with acute symptoms, and these are people where completing daily tasks is difficult. Yeah. They're having a hard time caring for themselves and or their babies. Right. right? Right. These people need a higher level of care. And that's yes. where intensive outpatient programs and partial hospital programs are necessary mm -hmm. and effective yes. to help stabilize those symptoms and bring people who are really struggling back to their baseline. Uh, right. And there are, I mean, it's like what you're saying is so necessary. I, I don't. I don't know, you know, just the people who don't know about perinatal mental health, let's just assume that there's somebody listening now who's just learning about it for the first time. Um, it sounds like you would be able to access this care anywhere because it's so important 
because it's so, like so needed and so necessary. And also maybe, you know, they, it's, it's hard to fully grasp and understand how bad it can get, how difficult and intense it can be. Um, but uh, like maybe a little bit to what we were talking about before, there, there's not, this isn't available everywhere. Like there's one in New York, a partial hospitalization. Maybe there's a couple of IOPs. I'm not sure. We have one PHP, we have one IOP. Uh, and then on the East Coast, um, I could be wrong because there are a few more popping up, but Rhode Island is the program we modeled our PHP after. So they have a PHP at women and infant. There are far fewer partial hospital programs in the U.S. than there are intensive outpatient programs, mm -hmm. which I understand for a couple of reasons. They're less time. It's less of a time commitment. So mm -hmm. IOPs are three hours a day, three days a week, as opposed to five hours a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. But even so, if you're looking at these higher levels of care, you know, again, there are new ones popping up, but like. I want to say like we're well under 50 if you put them all together. Like it's not like across the you US. find an IOP <laughs> or a PHP yeah. in every city or state. Yeah. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly unfortunate, right? right? Because you know, one of the things that that we talk a lot about again with elected officials or providers is the cost of untreated PMADs, mm -hmm. right? And we all are very familiar with the report that came out a couple of years ago that put a price tag of $14.2 billion a year in the U.S. in untreated PMAD costs, which, you know, 32000 per dyad is pretty low. So I would guesstimate that that price tag is significantly higher. Mm -hmm. That said, when you look at the cost savings, right? Mm -hmm. And to take even like this is speaking to, you know, somebody who's looking through the lens of just dollars. Right. If you were to invest more in these higher levels of care, mm -hmm. which are providing intensive treatment for four to eight weeks, and you compare that investment mm -hmm. to the years of adverse impacts that we know to be true right. on both infant child, adolescent, and adult as a result right. of untreated PMADs right. and that mother birthing person, mm -hmm. the cost is astronomical, right? right. When we think right. about health issues, whether it's you know obesity or it's other health issues for mom mm -hmm. as a result of untreated PMADs, whether it's uh, you know cognitive, developmental uh, issues and challenges for child, Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, you know, having difficulty, uh, you know, academically, we see a higher incarceration rate, like, it just mm -hmm. goes on and on and on, right? When if we were to invest in these short term solutions that right. save lives, right, and have generational impacts, because right. they really do, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we're treating, we are, we are uh, empowering mothers with the skills to be mothers, and then they are teaching their children the same. Right, right. It's laughable to me that we mm -hmm. don't have these on every street corner. No kidding. Because we know how many women are suffering, and we know that this intervention works. So if, what is the, I don't know what the right term is to use, like how many people can can be in your partial hospitalization program at any given time? So we have the capacity to treat 40 at the Motherhood Center. We just had our license doubled uh, over a year ago okay. by the Office of Mental Health. Wow. Now, mind you, when we opened our doors in 2017, seven years ago, we opened with four staff. We now have over 50 staff. Uh, all of us at one point were operating in that facility in person. The mm -hmm. pandemic happened. We okay. figured out how to do all of this virtually, which still amazes me. We ran a totally virtual perinatal partial hospital program That's for amazing. two years plus. So now we're in a position where uh, we have to move. We have to find a bigger facility. And I share that because we don't have the space right. to treat 40 women at once. So we usually get to about 25. 
Um, and what we've had to do is we don't just have one cohort, we have two cohorts running mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So we have two groups of both pregnant and postpartum women and birthing people experiencing the same interventions and curriculum mm -hmm. running simultaneously wow. um, in two separate group rooms uh, because you know anything over 10 to 12 yeah. patients per cohort, yeah. It, it it doesn't have the same impact right. for the patient or for the yeah. treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So although we have the capacity to treat 40, we don't have we have to we have to grow to meet that capacity, which we're in the process of doing. Right. So I mean the the demand, the need is absolutely there. It's not absolutely. like when we're talking again, I'm thinking about the person who's just learning about this for the first time. It's not like this is rare. Um, that like only a couple of people need this kind of support. Oh, I would say, I mean, look, in a lot of ways, I'm talking about the day program through the lens of clinical. Mm -hmm. This is like mom school mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm really being honest, mm -hmm. you and I both know, like nobody gave us the 10 commandments on motherhood <laughs> when we became parents, right? right? That, that there was this expectation that we were just supposed to know how to do this, that it, that it is, you know, it's just ingrained and it's mm -hmm. something that that we just know how to do. And nobody knows how to do this, right? Mm -hmm. The only mm -hmm. way we know how to do this is because we've watched it because we were parented and perhaps maybe we didn't have the greatest relationship with our own mother or parents. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our role models were not necessarily the greatest or the best, or maybe right. the things that parents did back then don't really cut the mustard anymore now, right? Right, right. right. And so nobody knows how to do this, right? right? Especially right. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So having programs like this that not only provide the clinical intervention, mm -hmm. but also the skills to be a mother and mm -hmm. to find that support as we experience matrescence, right. I share that because anybody would benefit from the day program. Right. Every new mother should have access right. to this level of support right. and, and skills building. It's like, it, it, it's like, it, it's amazing to me. And I have to remind myself this with two teenagers, right? You know, so much of what we do in the day program has to do with cognitive behavioral skills, dialectical behavioral skills. How do you manage your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Embracing concepts of radical acceptance, which nobody ever wants to embrace in the beginning. People <laughs> just want to throw darts at it because uh -huh. it's so hard to stomach. But like, these are basic life skills Right. Nobody taught us how to do that. Right. We had to figure that out by watching others or learning on our own accord. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I see this because really everybody right. can benefit yeah. from this partial hospital program model who's learning how to be a mom. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, to be more clinical, I think people with moderate to severe symptoms absolutely can and should have access to this level of care. It's what they need. It's what they deserve. Absolutely. It's, it's so true. I mean, I, in California, we have a couple of options out here, but certainly not enough uh, yeah. at all. And it, it leaves people feeling um, worse longer, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's like, I, I can pull together resources and create something, but it's not nearly enough as an individual provider. If I can't, if they can't get into an IOP or something like that, um, it, if it were more available, I, it, there would just across the board be less suffering. Yeah. I mean, you in California have one of the modelist of models, if only we could replicate El Camino Hospital, because you've got everything on one. You have an IOP, you have a PHP, you have an inpatient, all for perinatal women. Yeah. And that's how our hospitals should be designed. Right. We should have access to every single level of care, depending on acuity, for a newer expecting mom or, birth per or birthing person struggling with a maternal mental health condition. That should be the gold standard of care that right. everybody has access to. It would be great. And there's still one in, <laughs> one one. in California, uh, one like that. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the program that you guys have is its own model um, that, that people can and should replicate. And I know that's some of what you guys do is do some consulting for people who, who want to start their own stuff, um, you know, programs. It's, it's a lot of work what you've done um, what you, what you and Catherine and everyone has done to, to provide this 
just absolutely crucial and necessary resource. It is an enormous amount of work. And I'm channeling Catherine when I say this, and I say this with love. Had we known what we were getting ourselves into, <laughs> I don't know that we would have done it. It's hard. Uh-huh. It's really, 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 really hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to get the buy-in. Mm-hmm. It's hard to get people to come. Mm-hmm. It's hard to stay afloat in a competitive landscape. Mm-hmm. It's hard to work um, on the backdrop of a uh, insurance landscape that doesn't value behavioral health, particularly for women in the way that it should. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of obstacles that make this model incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. And yet we persevere because yeah. we know it's important and we know that women need this um, and we'll keep doing it. But it's it's very, very difficult. And, and the systems and the structures we have in place do not easily support mm-hmm. these levels of care. And that's unfortunate. Right. right. It's really it, unfortunate. It well, I hope going back to, you know, what you were talking about before about maternal mental health arriving and it being in the White House and all of the bills. And I know it takes a while for stuff to you know, when it comes from, you know, the top or whatever you want to say to make its way down to usable everyday changes. Um, but now, now more than ever, it could more quickly be doing that. I, I believe that, look, you know, in the New York state maternal mental health recommendations, higher levels of care were in there, right? The task force mentions having access to more affordable maternal mental health treatment options, right? Mm -hmm. The conversation's changing. The focus is on keeping new and expecting mothers and their families safe Mm -hmm. uh, and connecting them to care. And we're going to continue if the last thing I do, and I know you do, and PSI and all the other great people that are working on this issue, we will keep it front and center. We will shine the light on it. We will not let it go silent. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to push for policies, for Mm -hmm. programs Mm -hmm. that meet new and expecting moms where they're at and make sure that they get this necessary care. So I don't see this issue going anywhere. We've created an army of Mm -hmm. women boots on the ground that are yeah. going to scream as loud as they can <laughs> to keep this issue front and center. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do more and it's going to continue to get more and more support and, and investment. And this is just the beginning. I do believe that this is just the beginning. So good. But the last thing I would say, Kat, is we started this conversation in the very beginning talking about the voices of women and birthing people that have lived experience. Mm-hmm. And all of those voices and how oftentimes it's that lived experience that really informs people to make totally different life changes and professional changes and enter the maternal mental health space because of what they've been through. Right. And I just want for everybody who's listening to this, if you are a new or expecting mom or birthing person that is struggling, that has struggled, we're all going to use our stories differently. There are some people that might want to keep this very, very private. Um, Maybe they won't tell anyone. Maybe they'll just talk to their partner about it. Mm -hmm. And there are people that are going to want to scream their experience from the rooftops Mm -hmm. because they don't want other new and expecting moms and birthing people to struggle as they did. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give permission to all of the people out there that might be listening that can connect with postpartum depression, anxiety, or any of these other perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Your story is so powerful Mm -hmm. and it can move mountains. Mm -hmm. It can make a difference. Mm -hmm. It can absolutely make a change and it can make a change on a micro level. It could be just you speaking to one of your dear friends who's struggling too and saying, you're not alone. I know what's going on. I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. to getting up in front of Congress and testifying in support of a bundle of bills to improve maternal mental health outcomes. Our stories are powerful, they're motivating, and they can make a difference, right? Mine did. Yeah. Yeah, and so. so many other women's stories can. Um, and I just, I want people to know that um, because I know sometimes we can feel like we're just a, a little person in a big sea. And with like the ocean as our connecting theme in today's conversation, Mm -hmm. the more people that we have in that ocean, the more we fill it up uh, with voices um, and power um, and the more we continue to push that dial. So just want to, I want everyone to know your story is power um, and it can, it can move mountains. Beautiful. 
Thank you so much for, for that. That's such a needed message. And I, I just appreciate all of the work that you're, you're doing. And I mean, we only scratched the surface <laughs> of all that you do and it's, it's incredibly powerful and I'm so glad you're out there making a difference. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with you. I'm such a fan girl mm -hmm. and you are doing exactly the same. So I just feel really honored and privileged to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please go to the motherhoodcenter.com to find out more about this amazing program, especially if you or somebody you love is in need of care, or if you are somebody who is in the field of perinatal mental health and is interested in expanding care in your region, the Motherhood Center is a beautiful model. And there's so much to be learned from the partial hospitalization program that they offer. You can also connect with them on social media at the Motherhood Center. If you're just now listening to the Mom and Mind podcast, you're just joining us here, please make sure you're following and please, please give us a review. Your review is so important because it helps other people to know how this podcast can support them. So please go on over to your favorite podcast platform, hit follow, hit subscribe. And if you have a moment, just give us a star rating, a couple of sentences on the impact that this podcast has had for you. I thank you so much for being with us. Until next time.